Welcome to the Federalist Society's virtual event. This afternoon, August 26th, we're hosting a fireside chat with Professor George Lanou to discuss his recently published article titled, The Race Card and ARPA's Food Supply Deck. My name is Evelyn Hildebrand, and I'm an Associate Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Professor George Lanou, who Mr. Ken Marcus will introduce, and Mr. Ken Marcus who will moderate our discussion this afternoon. By way of a very brief introduction, Ken is the founder and chairman of the Louis D. Brandeis Center for Human Rights Under Law. He is the former Assistant U.S. Secretary of Education for Civil Rights, and he's currently the chairman of the Federalist Society Civil Rights Practice Group. So we're very pleased to welcome both Ken Marcus and Professor George Lanou for this afternoon's discussion. After our speakers give their opening remarks, we will turn to the audience for questions. If you have a question, please enter it into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And we will handle questions as we can towards the end of this afternoon's program. You may, enter, you may enter a question at any time, however, so you don't need to wait until the end to enter a question. With that, thank you for being with us today. Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you, Evelyn, for that kind introduction. Uh, two other. Uh, credentials uh, I might uh, mention. Uh, one is that I am honored to be a former colleague of Professor George Lanou, having had the privilege of working with him uh, when he was um, one of our lead experts uh, for the U.S. Department of Education's Office uh, for Civil Rights during the George W. Bush administration. Uh, he provided uh, invaluable support to the work that we were doing uh, to examine race-neutral alternatives to racially uh, preferential affirmative action. Uh, additionally, uh, I'm also proud to say that I am a former co-author with Professor George Lanou. Uh, I had the pleasure several years ago of co-authoring with him uh, an article on serious considerations of race-neutral alternatives uh, in, uh, uh, in American uh, higher education that appeared in the Catholic uh, University Law Review. And uh, since it uh, discussed in detail the work of uh, uh, former Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, we also had the disquieting uh, experience of presenting it uh, in front of her at, a, at an event at Catholic University. Well, this is, this is a, an event I've been looking uh, forward to. I'm uh, glad to be able to uh, share Professor George Lanou with those who are uh, less familiar with his important uh, work. Uh, but beyond that, I'm uh, glad to be able to share with a broader audience a story that I think is not uh, told enough, which is uh, twofold. Uh, one, it has to do with the aggressive use of uh, racial preferences um, by uh, uh, Congress. We think a lot nowadays, uh, I believe, about the increasing aggressiveness of civil rights um, uh, activists in uh, critical race theory, in affirmative action, in, in higher education. Uh, but there are other stories to be told about equally or more aggressive uses of racial preferences uh, in other areas uh, like uh, small business or agriculture. Uh, the other part of the story, though, is about the way in which conservative and libertarian lawyers have been able, through strategic litigation, uh, to address them and to aggress them with considerable vigor. So this is in a story that I think needs to be told. Uh, George Lanou is a great person uh, to tell it. Uh, George is Professor Emeritus of Political Science uh, and Professor Emeritus of Public Policy at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. He served as a trial expert in 20 cases involving public procurement preferences for 30 years. He was director of the Project on Civil Rights and Public Contracts at UMBC which contributed 289 uh, contracting disparity studies recently to the Library of Congress. He's been a consultant to nine governments and trial expert in 30 cases where the validity of disparity studies was at issue. Professor George Lanou, we are very pleased to have you with us today. Thank you, Ken. It's uh, great to be working with you and, and thank you to Evelyn for arranging this and to the Federal Society, which is an important uh, vehicle for discussing these uh, complex issues. One reminiscence that, that uh, I recall that you, you alluded to was when we jointly presented our paper on race neutral alternatives and we're discussing Croson, Justice O'Connor was very graciously uh, sitting in the front row. Uh, 
and it's intimidating to uh, critique and and evaluate a, a decision with a Supreme Court justice sort of sitting ten feet from you. And uh, uh, she she she's a very gracious lady, and it was it was a wonderful opportunity that we both had. And I, I appreciate that memory. She was very gracious, and in, in, indeed, I'm uh, not sure that she uh, expected the degree of uh, criticism uh, that she received, uh, but was very uh, good humored uh, and, as you put it, gracious about it. Yes. George, you've made uh, major contributions to various areas. I think that uh, you are the expert on the issue of civil rights in government contracts. Uh, you have made and continue to make significant contributions uh, to the study of civil rights and free speech and academic freedom in higher education. Um, tell us what is it about the federal uh, bailout legislation um, that you describe in uh, the race card in Ar ARPA's uh, food supply deck? What is it about this that drew you in to, uh, uh, to write this important new article in uh, the F Federalist uh, Society Review? Thank you. The, the uh, reason that I wanted to investigate this is partly because it's not been covered well. There are so many other news events that are overwhelming this story. But it's an important uh, issue because it is the most, uh, the ARPA race preferences represent the most overt and aggressive use of race preferences in, in the history of federal uh, legislation. And the widespread uh, judicial response to them, which has rejected them, is also uh, very unusual. When you look at, at the history of federal uh, race preferences, there have been several uh, programs. Um, the uh, Federal uh, Administ the Small Business Administration's 8A program, uh, which uh, provides uh, contracts to uh, socially and economically disadvantaged contractors, which are then defined uh, racially and ethnically. Um, the uh, Small Disadvantaged Business Program, which uh, uses slightly different uh, 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 techniques to get contracts to the same group of socially and economically disadvantaged uh, uh, contractors. And the Disadvantaged Business Program, um, which uh, uh, uses again the same concept of socially and economically uh, disadvantaged uh, persons. Uh, all of these uh, programs depend on a particular definition of who is socially and economically disadvantaged, which is race and eth ethnically based. So that when the ARPA legislation, which was, uh, uh, was signed by President Biden on March 11th, uh, 2021, so you can see how fast from the time of inauguration to the time of signing this legislation, this process went forward. Um, and the intention was uh, to create benefits for uh, particular racial and ethnic groups. Uh, there was very little, very little time to redesign uh, what had been the precedents. So the social and economically disadvantaged concepts were simply imported into the into two provisions in the in the ARPA programs. And when I saw that that had happened, then I began to read that the courts were uh, uh, rejecting this approach. It seemed to me that the issue was not just uh, what might happen to the ARPA provisions, but what the implications were for other federal programs which were based on the same social and economically disadvantaged concepts. Um, good. So of course, when we're talking about um, ARPA, we mean the American Rescue Plan of 2021. Um, I take it that there were probably two uh, aspects that especially uh, interested you uh, in ARPA, the one provision dealing uh, with restaurants and the other with, with agriculture. Could you give us a little bit of the, the, the context and the way in which uh, race was uh, considered, um, especially in the Small Business Administration, give us a, a context to what we were looking at, um, especially on the restaurant side? Okay. Um, there, isn't, there isn't any question that, that the uh, restaurant uh, 
business uh, writ large. The, the the legislation includes not only a uh, traditional restaurants, but really food uh, servers of, of, of various kinds. Uh, and they were hurt badly by COVID. Uh, many of those uh, businesses had to be shut down entirely. Others could serve only customers on a very limited uh, basis. And uh, they had to lay off uh, huge numbers of, of workers. Uh, and so uh, Congress, uh, in its uh, uh, relief efforts, appropriately address the problems of that of that industry. Uh, but when they chose to do so, they chose to create a situation where uh, only some uh, restaurant owners could uh, apply during what was called the priority period. They set a, a 21 day priority period for application. And you could apply if you were a woman-owned business, a, a veteran-owned business, or a uh, socially and economically disadvantaged business. If you were a white, uh, non-veteran restaurant owner, you could not apply for these relief funds during the priority period. And the problem was that the amount of money that Congress appropriated was, was nowhere sufficient uh, to the to the need uh, in, in in this area, and so uh, uh, there was a great danger that the money was going to run out before any white non-veteran uh, restaurant owners could could possibly apply, and that was what uh, set up the uh, the litigation. Well, before we get to the litigation, um, maybe you could talk a little bit more about these these preferences and who got the uh, uh, the preferences. It looks to me as if there's a remarkable list of uh, groups of individuals who would get the preferences and a small group uh, who would not. Uh, it appears uh, perhaps that there is an effort to uh, give preferences uh, to people from the, the Far East, but not the Middle East, uh, to um, uh, Hispanic Americans, including white Hispanic Americans, but black uh, Americans and not white African Americans. Uh, looks like uh, Pakistan uh, is included, but refugees from uh, Afghanistan uh, are not. Uh, is there any uh, rhyme or reason uh, to the uh, list of people who get preferences and those who do not? Well, the 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 list is a a fascinating and rather nonsensical list. And it was created, I've, this has been an area of uh, research that John Sullivan and I have uh, pursued. We wrote an article in the Journal of Policy History about it. And essentially what happened was that um, Congress laid out in broad terms uh, who would be considered uh, a, a, a minority. And then uh, various bureaucrats, probably five or six of them, uh, created this this list, and once this list was created, then it became kind of locked in in, in all forms of uh, legislation. It's in the 8A program, the SDB program, uh, the DBE program, and now in ARPA. And as you suggest, the the list uh, is 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 strange when you look at it. But here's the important thing: it had never been judicially challenged until uh, we'll we'll talk about how it has been. But looking at the list, for example, uh, the first category is black, and then in parentheses it says, a person having origins in any of the racial groups of Africa. And you and I were talking earlier that uh, anthropologists now believe that we're all, uh, uh, our, our, our origins are, are, are from Africa. But the reason why it's worded in that way is to exclude uh, North Africans, and to exclude uh, white settlers in South Africa or Rhodesia or someplace. The second category is Hispanic. And then it says persons of Mexican American, Puerto Rican, Cuban, Central or South American, or other Spanish or Portuguese origins or culture. Now, Spanish and, and, and Portuguese persons are white uh, and are not, uh, there's no demonstrable evidence that they are any more disadvantaged than Italians or Corsicans or, or, or other people. And then there's Native Americans, uh, and, and that, is, that is a group that has fairly clear definitions. But then there's finally um, the, the category of, of Asian Americans, and then 
then it really gets strange. It has the large groups that you would expect, but then it has um, uh, the American Trust Territory, the Pacific Islands, the Republic of Peru, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, the Federal States of Micronesia, the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, Samoa, Kabati, Havalu, Nauru. I mean, it, it just, it just, uh, it, it doesn't, it doesn't define Asia in, in, in the way that normally Asia is defined. And, and specifically, uh, it excluded um, uh, Afghanis and some other, uh, the, the new Asian republics, the post-Soviet republics uh, are, are excluded from this. So you had this list that was the core of all of the federal um, race preference programs that just got incorporated into ARPA because it was available in the, in the very brief time that ARPA was put together. And now uh, that definition of who's socially and economically disadvantaged is in both the restaurant program, which we'll discuss in detail, and the uh, USDA program. And now it is being challenged. And, uh, and to get ahead of our story a little bit, it, it, it doesn't do well when judges begin to look at it. And just uh, one example, uh, if you were from the Pashtun tribe uh, in Central Asia, would you, would you get the preference or would you not get the preference? Well, uh, the, the Pashtuns are the, the largest tribe in, uh, in Afghanistan, I think 48% of the population. But they're also a huge part of Pakistan. The current president of Pakistan is a Pashtun. So if you're a Pashtun who is living at least temporarily in Pakistan and has Pakistani citizenship, you and, and you came to the United States and became an American citizen, if that was your origin, you would be eligible. You would be socially and economically disadvantaged. On the other hand, if you were a Pashtun who lived in Afghanistan and, and came to the United States and had citizenship, you wouldn't be included. And it, it, just, it just doesn't uh, uh, pass any kind of a, uh, a facial test to say, well, uh, Pashtuns on one side of the line are socially and economically disadvantaged, but, but not on the other side. Okay, quite a, uh, o o only uh, a Congress and the federal government could come up with this. So tell us a little bit more about this program and how the legislation was uh, challenged uh, in the courts. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> what Congress did was to uh, provide, uh, I think it's 26.8 billion, but I might be a little off on that, um, uh, for restaurant relief. Well, there are 660,000 restaurants in the United States. Uh, there are 40,000 uh, uh, restaurants owned by uh, Chinese origin people and 40,000 by Mexican origin people. So you, you see right away, you've got huge numbers of potential claimants for a very limited amount of money. And uh, within a, a very short period of time, the Small Business Administration was overwhelmed uh, with uh, requests for relief within the 21 day priority period. But white non-veteran restaurant owners were not permitted to apply during that permit that period. And so the great likelihood, certainly the courts found, was that they might not get any money at all, even though the financial condition of their business, the, the, the suffering they had endured because of COVID was exactly the same as the people who, who were gonna get the money. So, uh, a, 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 a number of, uh, of uh, uh, restaurants challenged this. And when I say restaurants challenged it, one of the important things in the story is that while litigation in other areas regarding federal preferences has largely been financed by individual businesses or uh, uh, business associations, the legislation, the litigation uh, challenging uh, ARPA has been brought by uh, uh, interest group uh, agencies, and we'll discuss that later, but uh, the, the first case to, uh, to be brought, uh, which was uh, uh, brought by the uh, um, Wisconsin uh, Institute for Law and, and Liberty uh, is uh, uh, called uh, the Batulo case. And uh, that case went to uh, uh, was was uh, brought in Tennessee uh, 
And the district court judge found that the various uh, comments in the in the congressional record about the severity of COVID and and the the uh, uh, problems uh, uh, that the industry faced uh, were sufficient that that there was a compelling interest uh, for uh, the preferences in the in the what's called RFF restaurant uh, revitalization funds. Then uh, Will faced a, uh, a, 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 a difficult situation. They had brought the case, they had lost it at the district court level. So then they decided to file an emergency motion for an injunction pending an appeal and to expedite that appeal to the Sixth Circuit. And I described this as sort of a, the equivalent of a Hail Mary football pass, since the court was being asked to in, in, interrupt its current appellate calendar to render an immediate opinion on an extremely important constitutional issue involving billions of dollars. And courts don't like to be put in that position. There, there, there wouldn't have been a complete record, uh, but the uh, uh, Sixth Circuit panel accepted it. And then the outcome of that case uh, is uh, extremely important. Please tell us about it. All right. Uh, the formal name of the case is Vitulo, V-I-T-O-L-O -O versus Guzman, G-U-Z-M-A-N, Guzman being the, the uh, uh, small business uh, association, uh, small business administration person who is administering this. Um, the, the Sixth Circuit was divided. The two-person majority, uh, Judge Amul Thar Tharpar and Alan Eugene Norris, saw the immediate need for hearing the case uh, since the key to getting a grant, I'm quoting them, the key to getting a grant is to get in the queue before the money runs out. And they found that the case was not moot because there's a real risk that the RF, RRF funds would run out before the Vitulo application could be processed. Uh, in, in fact, uh, the SBA reported uh, that nine days after applications opened, uh, more than 260,000 businesses had applied for release funds for more than 65 billion on almost more than twice the amount that Congress had appropriated. So the, the court was realistic that, uh, that if this case couldn't be heard, um, white non-veteran restaurant owners simply, uh, it would be too late. So the majority then looked at uh, four factors for considering a preliminary injunction and came to the uh, same conclusion as a uh, earlier Texas court decision had. And, and here's the key point. They said that in, in evaluating the likelihood the plaintiff would win on the merits, the majority noted that Croson holds that governmental racial classifications cannot rest on quote, generalized assertions that there's been past discrimination in an entire industry. The evidence must be of intentional discrimination. It must consist of active or passive governmental discrimination. And the government didn't have any of that. And the majority found that the SBA rules were based only on allegations of societal discrimination, which is not a su uh, sufficient compelling interest. So the government lost on the compelling interest prong of strict scrutiny. They also lost on the narrow tailoring prong. And I think the, the, their loss there is perhaps the most significant. And here it goes back to the, the use of the category of socially and economically disadvantaged, which was the, the category that determined uh, whether on racial terms you had a, were in the priority or you weren't. And Judge Tharpar, uh, who wrote the uh, uh, majority opinion, who is, uh, I should say, uh, has an interesting background. He's the first federal judge of South Asian origin in American history. And he asked a question that perhaps was more keenly on his mind than it had been on some other judge's mind. But he said that that looking at the SBA list, which we've talked about, uh, there were preferences for Pakistanis, for, but not for Afghans, Japanese, but not Iraqis, Hispanics, but not Middle Easterners. And he said, none of this is supported by any evidence in, in, in the record. Now, uh, 
there isn't any good answer to the judge's inquiry. Just decades of bureaucratic uh, repetition. It just got passed from one kind of legislation to another kind of legislation without any review in Congress or, or in the courts. And what's significant about this is that it now can be expected that the question of why one group but not another group is going to be given racial preferences is always going to be in court cases and it will be asked of government witnesses and that that these cases are going to be brought more frequently now that that the uh, the court has uh, uh, raised it so the court found the majority found that uh, that the government had neither a compelling interest nor had narrowly tailored and there was one dissent and the dissent i think is 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 very interesting. Uh, Judge Bernice Bowie Donald uh, dissented and she said, quote, it took nearly 200 years for the Supreme Court to firmly establish that our constitution permits the use of race-based classifications to remediate past discrimination. But it took only seven days for the majority to undermine that longstanding and enduring principle. And then she, she went into what is, I think, is a, a, a fundamental issue in, in these cases. That is the, the difference in viewing the government's role as one of creating equity, which means distribution of resources to groups based on their population, or equal protection, which means that individual persons are entitled to protection uh, and, and can't be discriminated against in order to favor one group over another. But Judge Donald in dissent said, the appellate majority's reasoning suggests we live in a world in which centuries of intentional discrimination and oppression of racial minorities has been eradicated. And that the COVID-19 pandemic did not exacerbate those disparities. Uh, she thought that uh, congressional testimony created a compelling interest, and she was particularly annoyed because the appellate court's unusual procedure in handling this appeal, we are now left with a binding published decision, she said, etched in the stone of time. So the, the, the consequence of the Sixth Circuit's opinion is that there is a precedent. And then uh, the, the uh, uh, Small Business Administration had to decide, uh, and the Justice Department had to decide what to do. And they decided not to appeal. Um, there are various reasons for that, but the consequences of, of not appealing is that the, the priority system had to be dismantled. And it was uh, a messy process because by the time the Sixth Circuit decided, a number of uh, firms in the priority program had either gotten money or had been promised they were gonna get money. And now uh, the SBA is saying, no, we can't do that anymore. We're gonna have to, we're gonna have to process applications of white owned restaurants that were excluded from the priority period first. So you have an initial race-based and sex-based uh, uh, priority. And now, now you're reversing it in order to compensate. And the restaurant industry is, is not happy with this because there's not enough money to go around. Uh, restaurants that thought they were getting money are not gonna get money. And so uh, I think it's fair to say that the government has created quite a mess in this area. What a disaster. Um, George, now, if we could, let's turn now to the uh, Department of Agriculture. Uh, the USDA's um, uh, debt relief uh, was another part of the same, uh, the same uh, bill. Um, tell us about uh, that aspect of the, uh, the legislation. It's called Section 1005A2. And essentially what what it is composed of is a, uh, a debt relief program. Uh, farmers have to borrow money um, during the period before their crops are harvested and to invest in equipment and other kinds of things. And they borrow it from uh, the Department of Agriculture. And 
the Department of Agriculture uh, uh, and in cooperation with the uh, uh, House Agricultural Committee and with the uh, senatorial sponsors of uh, Senator, Senator Brooker and Senator Warnock uh, had create, created this program uh, that socially and economically, and there's that term in that category again, farmers would be entitled to debt relief up to 120% of what they owed, which is, I don't know how you come up with 120%. I think lots of people would like to borrow money and then have, get 120% back. Extraordinary deal. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and what is significant about this is not just the, the terms of the program, but the justification for the program. According to the uh, administrator of the Farm Services Agency, all socially disadvantaged food producers, and we're talking here about farmers and ranchers, uh, have faced, quote, systemic discrimination with the cumulative effects that, among other consequences, led to substantial reduction in their numbers, reduction in the amount of farmland they control, and contributed to a cycle of debt uh, that uh, was exacerbated during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Agriculture Secretary Vilsack testi testified before the, House, before the House Committee on Agriculture that the USDA would forgive 13,000 to 15,000 loans to non-white food producers, and that might cost up to $4 billion. And then the administration of the program is particularly uh, interesting and I think uh, made judges a little nervous. Under this new debt relief program, uh, food producers were encouraged to update or submit new race and ethnic identification to their local USDA service center so that checks could be sent out quickly to them. Although socially disadvantaged persons did not actually have to apply for loan forgiveness, these per persons merely had to review and sign a letter mailed to them from the Farm Service Agency verifying the amount of their debt and their race or ethnicity. They did not have to prove any previous discrimination. Now, Secretary Vilsack could have used the emergency that COVID created as an excuse for expediting these checks, but instead he used another rationale, and I think this is significant. He said the urgency was created because, quote, prior effects to remedy specific individualized discrimination have failed to do the necessary work needed to address systemic discrimination. He said that food producers, food producers who were white, however, could not have their debts canceled regardless of their individual circumstance or the effect of COVID on their business. And the USDA announcement said the Biden-Harris administration is committed to, quote, to equity across the department by moving systemic barriers and building a workforce more representative of America. That's the classic equity agenda that if you have a, a workforce that isn't somehow representative, you need to, government needs to intervene in favor of uh, groups that are somehow underrepresented, even at the point of excluding uh, other individuals who have faced the same unfortunate uh, pandemic situation or other kinds of situation. So that naturally triggered some lawsuits. Um, yeah, uh, one, uh, one can imagine given this use of uh, race um, based on uh, that sort of uh, justification. Um, tell, us about the, tell us about the litigation. Well, again, uh, the Wisconsin Institute for Law and, and, and Liberty represented a class uh, which grew to a dozen farmers in, in nine states. And that's one of the significant differences of this kind of litigation. You're not talking about an individual firm that lost a, a contract. You're talking about a, a much wider group that is faced with a national program that has excluded them. And they filed the lawsuit in the Eastern District of uh, Wisconsin and asked for declaratory relief relief and an injunction. And uh, that was on April 29th. And by June 10th, uh, Judge William Greisbeck granted a temporary injunction in joining USDA from forgiving any loans based on race. And his uh, argument is an interesting one. He began his opinion by quoting that length the Vitulo opinion, which had been decided a mere 13 days earlier. 
So here, here's a here's a, a circuit court case in another circuit, not Wisconsin's, which is fifth, I think. Um, no, it's not. It's eight. Um, and and uh, but it, but it but it immediately sort of and, and that was that was about restaurants. But here it goes over into agriculture. And he said uh, he cited Croson's precedent that a generalized assertion of past discrimination in an entire industry does not establish a compelling interest. He concluded that aside from the summary of statistical uh, evidence, statistical disparities, defendants have no evidence of intentional discrimination by USDA in the implementation of recent agricultural subsidies and pan pandemic relief efforts. Furthermore, he found the USDA program was not narrowly tailored because there was no consideration of race neutral programs, such as quote, individual determination of disadvantaged status or giving priority to farmers and ranchers, regardless of race, who had been left out of previous pandemic funding. A mere two weeks later, Judge Marcia, Marcia Morales Howard of the Middle District of Florida, in a case brought by the Pacific Legal Foundation, also found the USDA program unconstitutional. And her reasoning, if sustained on appeal, uh, really presents a powerful challenge to all race-based public aid or contracting programs. She argued the implementation of sex, section uh, 1005 will be swift and irreversible, meaning the only way uh, to avoid the plaintiff's irreparable harm is to enjoin the program. She found that the USDA arguments that a compelling interest existed uh, she considered their arguments that a compelling interest existed, but she found, quote, serious concerns over whether the government will be able to establish a strong basis in evidence warning the implementation of a race-based program. But then she went into new judicial territory. She said, even if a compelling interest for this race-based program could be established, uh, it was not narrowly tailored because it provided relief to all minority farmers whether or not there was any evidence of discrimination against them as individuals. Now, typically in cases involving race-based programs, the issue is whether statistics showing general disparities or other evidence demonstrates that a particular group has uh, suffered discrimination. If the answer is yes, then all members of that group uh, become eligible for race-based preferences. In the segregation era, it certainly didn't matter whether an individual African-American was educated, affluent, or a successful entrepreneur, all still suffered from racial discrimination. But in the 21st century, that argument can still be made, but it's harder to prove. And in this case, uh, the judge suggests that, okay, even if you can come in with statistics showing that there's a general disparity, doesn't mean that every member of that class has been discriminated against and be narrowly tailored. You have to have a remedy that, that affects only those individuals that have been discriminated against. So the USDA has announced uh, that it will appeal uh, these two decisions, uh, but it is also asking for a delay in the proceedings. It will probably supplement the generalized statements about systemic discrimination and equity in agriculture with some more details in the multiple ongoing litigation. Uh, but that's going to be difficult. There is no relevant agricultural disparity study, certainly not one that encompasses the number of racial and ethnic groups uh, benefited by this program. Courts have not been sympathetic uh, to uh, widespread governmental uh, reallocations um, uh, for discrimination. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I'm sorry. Uh, are you are you pausing because there's a question from the audience? If so, I will uh, I'll read it uh, uh, for you. No, I'm I'm pausing to try to get back into the uh, the, the Zoom. Oh, I see. Uh, no, I think you're fine. I, can you see me? Yes. Okay, I can't see it, but go ahead. I don't need to see it. We can see you, we can hear you. And since you paused, I will, uh, I will share with you this question from the audience. Um, a, uh, a viewer wants to know if farmers were advised to update their race, was it required to prove parentage or was it only needed to state 
uh, was it only uh, required that someone had to state whether they are uh, Black, Asian, or Native American, or? or, or, or you, you simply have to assert an identification on a form. You don't have to prove anything about your parentage, and you certainly don't have to prove you were discriminated against. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so I don't know if you had anything further that you wanted to to say um, about the uh, either the uh, litigation or the status of this program within the Department of Agriculture before I ask you a more general question or two. It's it's just on pause. Uh, excuse me. It's it's the, the litigation is just on pause as the uh, Department of Justice uh, attempts to get more time to put its case together. Um, I, I, I think uh, they face a difficult question. They're, they're being sued. Um, uh, there are class actions. They're being sued in multiple jurisdictions. And I want to discuss um, the long-term significance of these cases and, and the problem that the government faces in defending in, in a moment. Um, well, I, I, I would invite you to do that because I think that there are real questions beyond these two programs, beyond the... Uh, restaurants, beyond the farmers, uh, what should we make of these apparently uh, very aggressive efforts uh, from the left to uh, increase the use of racial preferences? And what should we make of the, uh, the use of law uh, in the courts to, uh, uh, to block uh, these efforts uh, in the name of equal protection? Well, let me come to those uh, questions in, in, in my concluding remarks. Um, it's never possible to be certain about the trajectory of judicial doctrine, particularly when the relevant cases are only a few months old. Most of the rulings are preliminary injunctions with only one circuit court opinion and a divided panel at, at that. Nevertheless, uh, Judge Tharpar, some, nevertheless, something uh, important seems to be occurring. Judge Tharpar's challenging of the whole concept of racial and, and ethnic uh, national origin basis for who's rich, socially and economically disadvantaged and who's not has placed the DOJ in a difficult position. If it had a, if it had appealed on bunk, the precedents of the Sixth Circuit were not favorable. The majority in Vitulo had also carefully cited the precedents uh, of the Supreme Court, and the DOJ had, might have believed that the current High Court would not be supportive of the uh, use of racial priorities and might have even found the whole race-based social and economically disadvantaged concept invalid. Furthermore, the political optics of excluding white male entrepreneurs existing in every congressional district in the country might have been very unattractive. In any event, as we said before, on June 3rd, the SBA announced that it was halting its previous race and sex-based priority payments. The consistent losses in the district courts about the exclusion of white farmers and, and ranchers from USDA debt relief is also causing the, the DOJ problems. For now, its strategy, as we've said, is to, is to ask for delays. Uh, the Mountain States Legal Foundation in the Tenth Circuit, the Southeastern Legal Foundation in the Sixth Circuit, and the America First uh, Foundation in the Fifth Circuit are representing other white plaintiffs challenging the debt relief program in separate cases. Perhaps the government will find some previously overlooked evidence in the congressional record or produce expert witnesses, but creating a compelling interest for all of the groups now defined as socially and economically disadvantaged and arguing that there are no white farmers and ranchers who should be uh, in the preferred category for debt, debt relief is really gonna be a very difficult uh, task. There may also be, uh, that may also be an awkward position for many candidates to support in the 2022 midterm elections that no white farmers or ranchers should be eligible for debt relief. As Justice Sandra Day O'Connor stated in Croson, quote, if statistical disparities were defined as identified discrimination, that would give governments license to create a patchwork of racial preferences about any field of endeavor. And that's what has happened here. On the other hand, if DOJ does not successfully defend the current definitions of social and economically disadvantaged groups, 
And the use of that concept in other federal programs is jeopardized. And whatever that outcome, the newly energized litigating agencies that challenge the ARPA preferences are waiting for uh, these new challenges. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, sure. We've got a we've got an interesting question from uh, from another uh, audience member. Um, let me preface it by saying the following: I think um, as someone who is new to this area, uh, listening to uh, the ARPA provision on the Agriculture Department, might think that uh, Congress, uh, the courts, and uh, the Agriculture Department had not previously dealt with the question of. Uh, discrimination against uh, minority farmers. Uh, and yet this is an issue that has been addressed at considerable length for considerable time and considerable money. Uh, we have this question uh, from uh, Jack Park. USDA settlement of Pigford resulted in payments totaling some $4.4 billion to the disadvantaged farmers who also were helped by ARPA. Did Congress recognize this settlement? Should it have said uh, that it was in, insufficient? I think that's a very good question. I did not get into the details of the Pigford settlements, but uh, uh, they existed and involved, as the, as the questioner suggests, a great deal of money. And had USDA had, and Congress had said, look, there are some identified, um, these were all black farmers. These were, these were not farmers uh, in the total uh, social and economically disadvantaged ethnic and racial group categories. But if they had said that um, there were black farmers that had been discriminated against, but did not get appropriate Pigford settlements, and that the ARPA legislation was going to address that, uh, it would have been a wholly different situation. It clearly would have been permissible for the government to have provided relief to a particularly identified group of farmers who had been discriminated against in the past. But instead, the ARPA uh, debt relief program ignored the Pigford <laughs> settlements and farmers who had gotten uh, uh, relief from the Pigford sell settlements were still eligible uh, for 120% uh, uh, of the whatever debt they owed in the new ARPA legislation. So uh, that is certainly a, a narrow tailoring problem. Uh, the, the USDA program was not targeted to individual farmers who had been discriminated against, or even individual farmers who had suffered particularly COVID uh, uh, damages. It was targeted to all uh, farmers and ranchers who fit the socially and economically disadvantaged category. Um, as we consider uh, this uh, story, including the various uh, legal challenges uh, to the bill, do you view this as a story that should inspire hope or despair? Uh, despair, uh, for instance, regarding the uh, uh, extent uh, of the problems created by uh, Congress, or hope in terms of the uh, vigor uh, and variety of uh, legal challenges and the extent of their success so far? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, several things seem to have occurred which are going to, going to uh, direct the uh, future debate on, on this program. And I regard the debate as uh, reflecting the larger question of whether public policy should be di driven by equity redistribution of uh, resources and assets or equal to groups or equal protection to uh, individuals from government's attempts to categorize uh, uh, beneficiaries by uh, race and ethnicity. I think uh, these decisions uh, go and take an important step toward reinforcing the traditional equal protection to individuals and that so far the equity agenda of the Biden administration has not been successful. Perhaps uh, a more uh, careful uh, and limited uh, approach may be more successful, but the ARPA legislation was, uh, was essentially developed uh, in maybe a month and a half. Another uh, important development is that we now have five litigating agencies and maybe the others will join who have taken on the task of resisting uh, 
uh, race preferences, and they have been successful. And uh, they are unlikely to quit this field. I think they will uh, become involved. And that, that, that's an important change because uh, that means that you have some national perspective, you have multiple litigation, whereas in the past you had a, a particular uh, firm that had been um, disadvantaged uh, in seeking a particular contract and had to finance the case by itself and, um, and taking on um, uh, a government agency that is um, going to be the source of your future contracts is, is, a, is a daunting activity. And so many firm owners looked at the cost and the length of that kind of litigation and the possibility that whatever government agency they were going to seek contracts from in the future would be very annoyed with them and it decided not, 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 not to bring the, lit, uh, the litigation. The litigating agencies are not bound by those restraints and they seem very energized and have been successful. So I think they're going to stay in the field at least for quite a while. And then there is the question of what's going to happen in the electoral process. Um, what will happen? Can, can, let me put it this way. Suppose a secretary uh, Vilsack, who defended the equity agenda uh, in, in the USDA program. He was the uh, Democratic governor of the state of Iowa for, I think, two terms. Would he have run on a platform of excluding white farmers and ranchers in Iowa from, from uh, debt relief? I think that's not very plausible. And I think other candidates are going to find that to be a very uncomfortable position to be in. And I so the politics of this, because the the ARPA preferences were so visible and so national, and I think appeared to most people to be an indefensible part of COVID relief, I think they may play more of a role in electoral politics than these kinds of preferences have played in the past. Uh, thank you, George. Please forgive the background noise as we appear to be in uh, something of an of a electrical storm at the moment where I am. Uh, you mentioned five litigating public interest or organizations, and I think you've named some or all of them before. Personally, I think it's remarkable that there are now uh, five public interest advocacy organizations that are actively and effectively challenging uh, this sort of preferential uh, uh, activity and defending uh, the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, equally remarkable is that there are others uh, doing similar work that simply have not been in, involved in this particular uh, case, but they're involved in other uh, challenges to, uh, to preferences. Um, I would like to ask a, a different question because this was uh, raised by a, a law student. We have just a few minutes left, uh, so I'm glad to have uh, in the tradition of the Federalist Society, a law student uh, uh, provide the last question. Uh, he says as follows, uh, Ken mentioned in the beginning about race neutral alternatives to affirmative action. What evidence would be sufficient for the federal government to prove disparate impacts of the pandemic to satisfy strict scrutiny? How can the federal government balance acknowledging disparate impacts of the pandemic on different communities without resorting to racial categories or racial preferences? Well, that's, that's a really good question. Take restaurants, for example. Um, there is some evidence that restaurants owned by uh, members of minority groups and by women were more uh, affected uh, by COVID shutdowns than, than other restaurants, which were more perhaps more corporately owned. What the legislation could have done was to define uh, the need for restaurant relief based on uh, the severity of the impact of COVID, COVID both uh, epidemiology uh, and economically, and even picked out uh, various zip codes and said, we're gonna focus, we don't, have, we don't have enough money to serve 660,000 businesses. We're gonna focus on relief on those businesses in those zip codes that were most impacted by COVID. That would have probably disproportionately benefited minority and women-owned restaurants, but it wouldn't have excluded white restaurants in those same zip codes. I think that could have been done and it could have been quite defensible. Similarly, with regard to debt relief, 
uh, you can define that problem in a race neutral way. There were some, some farmers who were really hurt badly by COVID and other farmers in other parts of the country that were not, or because of the type of businesses they had, were not particularly affected. You could have done that too. But the identity politics agenda of some members of Congress and the Biden administration didn't go that way. They did not go toward a race neutral approach. They went toward a race conscious approach and the federal courts have rejected that so far. Thank you, George. For members of the audience who have missed any part of this, uh, the uh, event will uh, fortunately be available both as a podcast uh, through the Federalist Society uh, website uh, and also um, uh, as a uh, uh, video that can be seen, I believe, on, on YouTube. Keep an eye on the Federalist Society uh, website for that and for uh, other sorts of information. I'd like to say, George, that it's been a pleasure working with you now, uh, as in the past, and that I would strongly recommend to viewers who have not yet read uh, your article uh, in the uh, Federalist uh, Society Review, The Race Card in ARPA's Food Supply Deck, uh, that they go ahead and uh, do so. Thank you, George. Have a look. Thank you, Ken, and to the Federal Society. I appreciate it. Evelyn, did you? Have oh, yep, yep. Perfect timing. Uh, thank you very much to Professor George Lanou and to Ken Marcus for this great discussion this afternoon. And thank you to our audience for participating and sending in your questions. We welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. Keep an eye on your emails for announcements about upcoming teleform calls and virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned.